Uh, we currently farm 12% of all of the surface area, land surface area, on planet Earth. And if you zoom out a little bit, you look at all of this farmland across the entire globe, almost half of it is occupied by three crops. And these three crops all have a few traits in common. They're grasses, they're grains, and they're very productive in terms of uh, producing seed for humans to eat. Corn, wheat, and rice. Um, that's the three crops that make up almost half of all of our cropland. And I mentioned we're really good at producing yield from these three crops. That's what our ancestors have been focusing on for tens of thousands of years, breeding these crops that have big seeds that have high nutritional value. But what we've realized is that when we've replaced the landscape with these very productive crops, we've uh, altered the landscape and the ecosystem services that the land can provide. So right now, the farmland that makes up 12% um, of all of our surface area produces lots of crop production, but does not provide any of these other ecosystem services that society so dearly depends on. Things like resources for pollinators, regulation of water quantity and quality, uh, managing the carbon balance in the soil and the atmosphere. And these ecosystem services, or lack thereof, are uh, threatening human health as well as costing uh, communities a lot of money. So here's an example. This is a map that shows the concentration of nitrate in the drinking water uh, in Minnesota. All of the small dots are private wells, and these larger dots are municipal wells. So those that are in the red have uh, levels of nitrate that exceed the EPA's safe drinking limit of 10 parts per million, or 10 milligrams per liter. So you can see there's a couple of hot spots in Minnesota. Southwest Minnesota, there's a really shallow aquifer there. A lot of annual row crop production, uh, lots of contaminated drinking water. Uh, the central sand plains of Minnesota, so core structured soil, lots of nitrate can leach through the system and contaminate our drinking water there. And then down in southeast Minnesota, um, the problem is becoming, it's increasing. There's not as many of those high level wells yet, but there's a lot in the medium range. We have a karst geology down there, which is really prone to this leaching. So this is a, a problem that um, it has human health implications directly. It's, it's bad for us to drink water with nitrate in it. But it's also costing these communities a lot of money. So on a per household basis, you can see that it's in the thousands of dollars. And then big scale zooming out, we're all probably well aware of the dead zone, the Gulf of Mexico, which is related to nitrate, nutrient losses, nitrogen and phosphorus in our waterways. Um, this is a problem for the environment and for humans. So what we need to do and you've heard this about uh, from Don, the Forever Green Initiative is all about developing new crops that provide both uh, marketable, profitable yields and the ecosystem services that society depends on. So the first one that is really emerged out of the Forever Green Initiative um, in partnership with the Land Institute is Currenta. So the plant itself is called intermediate wheatgrass. Intermediate wheatgrass is a perennial forage grass that was brought to the United States in the early 20th century. And the Land Institute started domesticating that, turning it from a forage grass into a grain crop <coughs> in the early 2000s. And the Land Institute then officially partnered with the University of Minnesota around 2010 or so. And we've been working together to continue the improvement of the crop through breeding and genetics but also we've expanded the research program to study those environmental benefits as well as the agronomics. How do you grow this profitably? So I'm going to refer to both the plant and the grain as Kernza because it's a lot easier to say than intermediate wheatgrass over and over again in our presentation. So I'll refer to it as Kernza. Um, why did we select Kernza as the future perennial grain crop? One reason is because it has relatively large seeds already for perennial grass as this deep, dense root system that we've all seen photos of, provides the perenniality and it provides environmental benefits, stores carbon, 
filters water. It's also tolerant to a wide range of growing conditions. So we have collaborators growing Kernza in Utah to New York State, um, Sweden, um, Australia, South America, so, so a wide range of growing conditions. Before I talk more about the experiments and the agronomy, I want to give you just a quick timeline of what the life cycle of a Kernza cropping system looks like. We typically plant in late summer, early fall, we try to say before September 1st, uh, the plant will then grow vegetatively, just produces leaves throughout the fall till the snow flies. And then as soon as the ground is thawed, the plant continues to grow just vegetatively again for six to eight weeks. And then in mid-May, it essentially bolts, the stem elongates, produces a seed head, um, flowers, goes through physiological maturity and the grain is ready to harvest about mid-August. After the grain is harvested, the plant continues to grow just vegetatively again in the fall um, till the snow flies, so probably November or so. And then the cycle begins in the spring with regrowth, just vegetative regrowth. So at the University of Minnesota, as um, I mentioned we have a breeding and genetics program, um, but we also have a team working on the agronomics, and that's most of what I do, as well as a team that's measuring the environmental impacts. We have uh, a special initiative focused on implementation, so getting Kernza out onto the landscape, working with growers, we have an extensive outreach program. Um, to make sure that this is a low risk, high profitability system. There's a team working on the food science aspects. How do you use this as an ingredient in, a, in, new, food, uh, in new food products? We also have a team focused on commercialization. So we're developing the markets. Uh, we are developing the supply chains. You just can't take Kernza to the grain elevator right now. There are special markets and supply chains to go through and that's in development. So I'll just touch on some of the highlights of these different research activities. So just real quickly with the Kernza breeding. Ultimate goal, increase seed size and grain yield. And the breeders have done a pretty good job of this. So this just shows the seed size and this is essentially time, the breeding cycle. Uh, from the early 2000s at the Land Institute. And this is a, a pretty rapid pace. So the pace is 5 to 10% increase in seed size per year. To give you an idea of how fast that is, um, wheat has increased on average 1.8% per cycle since the early 1900s. So 1.8% increase in seed size. We're averaging 5 to 10%. So five to 10 times is faster. Now that's because it's a brand new crop. That This is expected, um, they call it the honeymoon phase of breeding with a new crop. It's going to be very fast in the first few decades. That will slow down, but right now we're making rapid advancements. One of the reasons we're able to make such rapid advancements is because we sequence the genome. We know roughly, uh, I have a general idea of which genes can control certain traits. So this means that we um, can move through the breeding program much more quickly. Uh, it does not mean that we are using any genetic modification in our breeding program. It's all still traditional plant breeding, mostly because genetic modification wouldn't make it any quicker. Um, and we don't need to do it. So we have the genome sequence that's helping us rapidly get through uh, increasing seed size and domestication traits. Now, um, a quick overview of the agronomics research <coughs> program. Studying everything from establishment to harvest and storage. Uh, yield longevity is a, is a major agronomic priority. Um, even looking at studies related to climate adaptation. How's this crop going to perform in 25, 50 years from now under changing climates? Uh, so our major objective is to increase yield and profitability. And we're looking at a number of different ways to do that. Um, one is uh, 
big part of our program is really focused on fertility. So lots of work on nitrogen and phosphorus fertility. Uh, and one sustainable way of providing the nitrogen for the Kernza could be by intercropping legumes into the system, which is what Beth mentioned. So we just initiated a new multi-state trial uh, in partnership with um, Wisconsin, Madison, and the Land Institute, where we're trialing uh, a number of different legume species, intercropping it with Kernza, different species that are suited for different uh, types of growing conditions. And we're going to find out which one performs best across these different states. Done a lot of work with row spacing. So these are just really these fundamental agronomic work. Uh, how do you harvest it? Do you swap it? Do you direct combine? What's the pros and cons to all of these different techniques? Uh, done some work with companion cropping too, or establishment. And I, if anybody has any questions about this, we can talk after the presentation. I have lots of details on and some preliminary recommendations for some of these practices. Uh, I would say the second top agronomic priority is to figure out ways to sustain yields through time. Right now, grain yields drop pretty dramatically after year two, probably about year three, sometimes in year four. Uh, yields drop from 800 to 1,000 pounds per acre down to 200 pounds per acre, to a point where it's not gonna be profitable for much longer. So how do you make that stand continue to produce seed through time? That's one of our major focuses. We're looking at disturbing the stand. Um, as it ages, it actually gets more and more dense. There's more and more plants in the field. Um, and when it gets more dense, each plant produces less seed. And that's the problem we're facing. So we're looking at ways to kill some of those plants in between rows, inter row cultivation, um, we're also doing the basic science to figure out why is the plant responding this way as it gets crowded, why is it producing less seed. Um, we're doing different trials to see if we can graze it to prevent that yield decline, clip it um, with mowing, using fire even. Uh, but the grazing aspect leads me to another part of the research program which is just really about increasing profitability. Another way to increase profitability is dual use, getting a second source of revenue from that single stand. Uh, one way is to graze it. As I mentioned, the, the plant produces vegetative leaves early in the spring and in the fall. Those can either be directly grazed uh, or harvested for forage. Other ways to increase profitability is through reducing inputs. Um, and one means could be by intercropping legumes to offset nitrogen fertilizer inputs. So grazing, forage, harvest. And this is a map of all the different trials of currents across the state of Minnesota. Um, it just shows you that we're testing it in a lot of different soil types, a lot of different growing environments. Um, we have a lot of water quality trials, greenhouse gas emissions, and agronomic trials. Um, and this kind of leads me into some of the environmental impacts research. So uh, I showed the Venn diagram, the different circles overlapping because they actually do overlap. So some experiments will sound like an agronomic experiment, but we're also going to be measuring water quality and soil carbon sequestration in that agronomic trial. And these are the environmental impacts or ecosystem services that we're really focusing on. Um, again, I mentioned the nitrate leaching. That's a, that's a really hot topic in Minnesota specifically. We have a lot of experiments across the state looking at the reduction in nitrate leaching from Kernza. And here's some of our data. So uh, on the y-axis is the concentration of nit nitrate in the soil water beneath the roots of Kernza, of Kernza, switchgrass, and corn. And this is over four or five different locations in a couple of different years. Here's that 10 parts per million or milligrams per liter safe drinking limit. Uh, on average, Kernza has very, very little um, nitrate in that soil water uh, as opposed to corn. And this is common, levels of 40 to 60. That's, that's frequently observed across the state. One of the reasons is because that deep, that deep, dense uh, root system is really, really efficient at capturing the nitrogen and utilizing it. So, here's a figure uh, looking at the amount of 
carbon storage potential of Kernza and managed with different nitrogen fertilizer sources compared to a corn soybean rotation and a wheat soybean rotation. <coughs> Negative values mean carbon storage. So you can see that there's a lot of potential here for carbon sequestration with the Kernza, um, which might not be surprising because of that deep, dense root system. There's a lot of carbon in those roots. Now I'll just quickly touch on some of our activities around implementation. Um, we have a bunch of research going on that's modeling how Kearns is going to perform across the state of Minnesota. So we can identify where's the best place to, to grow Kearns in the short term. Uh, we're developing uh, tools, grower tools. Um, we have a grower guidebook. We have lots of extension and outreach activities going on in this arena as well. Uh, and part of this is supported by um, state funding, legislative funding, LCCMR. And this is a really unique project. This is a, a list of the different stakeholder groups that's participating in this specific project around nitrate leaching. So you can see that we're working with the state uh, Department of Ag and Health, um, a city, uh, city of Chatfield, a rural water provider, Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water. They pump water from the groundwater and sell it to communities in a seven county region, of Southwest Minnesota. Um, Agricultural Utilization Research Institute, Minnesota Rural Water Association, Greenlands Blue Waters, a nonprofit really focused on outreach and extension. Uh, so together we're doing this research. We are planting large production scale fields of Kernza for demonstration. And we're using those sites to host these field days and outreach <coughs> activities. So it's a really cool integrated project. We're getting good data and also able to provide some education uh, to the community. And here's a map of, I think these are active currents of fields in Minnesota, roughly the acreage in different regions. So there's more than 500 acres of currents of being grown in Minnesota right now, which is about a quarter of the world's current production. There's about 2,000 acres worldwide. Um, these are some of the farmers growing that in Minnesota. Uh, so I just want to qu quickly end by acknowledging the team members. There's a big team of folks working on Kearns, uh, just representing the Forever Green, Kearns Group, Craig Schaefer, Don Wise, Jess Gupnik. Um, these are the new commercialization hires, Colin Curitan and Connie Carlson. Um, and Jim Anderson leads the breeding program, and Praveen is the uh, postdoc in that breeding program, who really does most of the breeding work himself. Um, I just want to acknowledge the farmers we work with, all the institutions and the stakeholder groups, and of course the funding agencies. This, none of this could be possible without the funding. So thank you so much to NC SARE, USDA, NEFA, we have a federal grant from USDA, Minnesota Le Legislative Trust Fund, um, and many others. So with the kerns of this morning, you talk like you plant it and then probably three years you have to replant it. Why does the seed production go down like that? You know, like with a lot of perennial grasses you use every year. Yeah, like I, I mentioned, the, gr the stand gets thicker. There's, there's more biomass there year after year, but that just produces less seed. So the reason why, well, we don't know. We don't exactly know why. Why does the plant stop producing seeds when it gets in a dense environment? One reason is because, and this is just I'm, I'm hypothetical here, but if a plant um, recognizes that it's really crowded, it costs a lot of energy for a plant to produce seeds. And if it has an indication that those seeds, it's already crowded, why would it produce seeds in a very competitive environment? That's one hypothesis. Uh, we have a lot of greenhouse experiments going on right now to figure out, looking at below ground signaling to see what's going on with different hormones and chemicals in the soil to see if the plants what it's responding to. The companion so, planting, would, would that help with that? You'd have more space in between the ferns of plants? And well, there's a couple of points to that. Yep, that could help. And another is intercropping could help. Just from there being a different species next to the kernza could prevent that uh, plant from shutting down seed production if it's a different species, especially if it's a legume providing nitrogen. It's some species that really dislikes and wants to crowd out by producing more seed. Yep. Can you speak to how Kernza 
might be different than say um, like when you come across uh, grass mixed with alfalfa hay field and in some of those plantings that grass would be intermediate wheat grass and how that differs. How the yeah um, the Kernza is a specific variety. We have a variety of Kernza now. It's called Minnesota Clearwater. Um, and physiologically, it's going to be different because it has bigger seeds and more seeds. It's going to be shorter. Uh, we've reduced the plant height so that it doesn't lodge. Um, so that's how it's going to look different from intermediate wheatgrass that might be in a forage mix. Um, but biomass yields, like total forage yields, are actually still pretty similar. Um, as, a, as the intermediate wheatgrass forage types, and the forage quality is still pretty similar. So which, does it which also good. compete then against the alfalfa over the long run, or? We've done a lot of alfalfa curds in our cropping trials, and the outcome really depends on the soil type and the location. In some instances, the curds will dominate the alfalfa after two or three years and take over. In other instances, the alfalfa will actually be more competitive and the Kernza will die back a little bit. And, but keep in mind that this is in, these are planted in rows and not like a forage mix where it would just be all mixed together in a sward. So it's, it's a little bit different environment in terms of competition. Kind of an insider here, but I got to ask a yeah. thought provoking question that, that I, I guess I'm stepped back a little bit. But. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, the success you've had in selecting for the shattering and for that variable maturity? Yeah, the shattering. So shattering is, a, is an issue with any wild, when you're trying to domesticate a wild plant. It wants to get rid of its seed. We want to hold on to its seed so that we can all harvest it in one shot. Um, they've made a lot of advancements with reducing shattering. Um, and this is important because so far we've had to swath everything knock it down at a pretty early maturity in terms of grain development and moisture content to prevent the shattering. So we'd have to swath it, but then we've had a lot of issues combining the grain out of the windrows and, and um, some mold and fungus problems on grain quality. So by reducing shattering, that allows us to go out and direct combine. It gives us more time to get out and let that, the seeds dry down on the standing grass uh, without falling off the stems, and then we can direct combine. So, um, just last year, I'd say we a majority of our fields we direct combine for the first time, and it's it's working out pretty well. So that's an important trait that we're working on. What's the other question? Oh, uh, that well, you kind of answered it, but just I'm th going back to Carmen Sick and talking to him that, that and I maybe you answered it already talking about the shattering, but. Was it part of the swapping because of the variable maturity yeah. Yeah. on the stock? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the seeds mature from the base upwards. So if you wait for all the seeds on the top to get to a safe moisture content, you're going to have some of those in the bottom shattering. Um, alternatively, you could harvest earlier and get those in the bottom, and then you're going to have wet seeds in the combine for those on top or are uh, less mature. What we've learned is that the seeds on the base are larger and they're worth getting and not letting shatter. So that's one reason to swath is that you can knock it down and, and ensure that you're going to get those large seeds. Um, but that's what our recommendation would be is, is to get out there earlier, especially if you have the ability to dry, if you have a grain bin where you can dry the kerns up definitely go out a little bit earlier and make sure you get those seeds that are at the base because they're the largest. Is it easy to get the hull off? It's, yeah, it's not too too bad. It requires a process, the dehulling process. Um, that's another trait that the breeders are working on is free threshing. So hopefully in the next couple varieties we'll have one that the grain will be naked out of the hull in the combine. So the combine will do the threshing. <coughs> but right now, um, about what I'd say about 20% of the seed still has a hull on, and then that needs to go through a dehulling process. Um, HFI is, was here as, a, as an exhibitor. They have uh, a line specifically developed to dehull Kernza. Yep. How drought tolerant is Kernza? 
it's, it's very drought tolerant. It's uh, a lot of the initial breeding work was done in Kansas. Yeah, a lot less precipitation than, than us um, here in the Upper Midwest. Uh, what it's 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 more susceptible to um, too much water, so it doesn't like to be wet. So like clay sand. Um, it grows pretty well in the sandy soils, and we're just going to be starting a new trial. It's planted it this past fall. We're going to be irrigating Kern's uh, um, Central Sand Plains. We're going to have a trial where irrigation versus no irrigation um, to see just how well it can perform without the irrigation, really. Because everything in that region is pretty much irrigated. So this could be a low input crop um, for those specific really sandy soils. Uh, I've done a lot of um, experiments in pretty heavy soils, and it, and it does okay if it's not too wet. Uh, 